own dreams. You're with Julian on the Brown Note. And private education and private health care are a moral obscenity and should be banned. <clears throat> now, we always talk about the impact of private health care and education. So we talk about the impact on the public systems and whether that's a negative thing. And then we have all these people that simp for rich people because one day they, I don't know, maybe think that they will be, who think that people deserve it. Well, let's look at it morally. If, you're, if you were wealthy and your child got really sick and went to hospital, is it, um, is it moral that if the nurse treating your child had a child who was equally sick with the same illness, that child would have worse health care than, the, than your child, the nurse's child who's looking after your child actually having worse health care for her own kid or for the parent of that nurse to have a worse outcome because historically her health care has been worse over her life in a strained public health care system. So her parents will probably not live as long as your parents if you're wealthy and have private health insurance and take your parents into a private system. Is that morally right that a child should have worse health care because their parents are poor? Isn't that a moral argument? Isn't it a moral argument to say that any child deserves worse health care? Why do we allow this to happen? It goes, it, it's something that originated and most countries in the developed world have moved away from. But where the right wing are continually trying to promote the notion that people who earn a lot of money are somehow more valuable to society. But is somebody that works for an investment bank more valuable than the nurse treating their child? I don't think so. I think some jobs are better paid because they get more money, not because they're more valuable to society or more skilled. Is it fair that if you're a wealthy person, your child gets a better education than the teacher's child who's teaching your kid? The, kid, your, the kid's done nothing wrong. None of the kids have done anything wrong. So why is it okay to consign them to a worse education and a worse life and worse health care? Why isn't the moral argument the, the primary focus of private health care and education. It segregates society into saying two of the most important aspects of society, health care, education, should be better for wealthy people. When in the majority of cases, wealthy people have inherited wealth or work in industries that at that particular point in history, society has paid massively over the odds for. No one is going to say that a bond trader is worth any nurse on earth. Yet, financially, that is very much the case. We rate jobs on their importance when it comes to us being sick or our parents being sick or when your child needs to be educated very differently from the pay packet someone like an investment banker gets. There is no point in your life when you've probably relied on an investment banker to the degree that you would with a sick kid and a nurse. We just pay these people a lot more money. So should they get better health care for their children and better education for their children? I don't think so, and I think it's morally disgusting. Private education isn't benign. And private health care isn't benign. They both lead to an erosion of the public service, making that nurse's child's care worse because they take money out of the public system. But they don't only take money out of the public system to fund private education and private health care. They drive up the costs. They drive up the costs of treatment and they drive up the costs of medicine 
as we have seen in America. They drive up the cost of university education until it's not in the grasp of working class children, no matter how smart they are. When we move any industry into wealth gathering, then it becomes less efficient because they can only increase profits by squeezing more money out of the consumer and giving the consumer less. Those are the two avenues to make more money. So it actually ends up giving the recipients of private health care and private education less and less for their money. And it also erodes the public system. This is from, um, this is based on the public health care system. This is from a, a Commonwealth Fund report, which you can um, read online, uh, ranking the best health care in the world by country. And it relates specifically to 11 nations that they've singled out for health care. There's no surprise at all that the top ones are the public ones, the uh, ones like Australia comes out very highly, but so, of course, do Norway, the Netherlands, Canada, France, Germany, the UK, all trounce last placed United States of America, which finishes 11th in six out of the probably 10 categories and near bottom in um, affordability as well. And the overall ranking of the United States healthcare system is, is last place, 11th. The UK is fourth place, and that's after decades of being run into the ground by the Tories. But that's not the only issue here. Another issue is, does private healthcare offer better services? We, we tell ourselves since Thatcher that privatisation offers a much more streamlined efficient well anyone that gets a bus in sydney knows that's crap anyone that's ever got a train in the post privatized trains in the uk knows it's crap as well the cost per capita of the uk's healthcare system is four thousand seven hundred and twenty five dollars a year per person and that is for free universal health care the american version which is non-universal health care and one of the most uh, privatised in the world, costs the taxpayers still, the government, per capita, per year, $10,687. You look at all of the other 10 countries in this list, they go from $3,888 up to $6,000 for Norway, which is an incredibly expensive country anyway. But then nearly double everyone else is the United States. The highest ranking healthcare systems in the world are not only the European nations, but also Singapore, Japan, China, which has the largest universal healthcare system in the world. Singapore, about 80% of all healthcare is universal healthcare publicly funded, as in, even if there's an, an insurance system which is mandatory that your employer and you pay out of your wages as a mandatory fee. You walk in and out of hospital without a debt. In America, you get 600,000 people on average going bankrupt every year with healthcare costs as the primary factor. You get 40,000 on average plus deaths based on the treatment being too expensive. My dad's just spent a month in hospital in New Zealand. He was, you know, he's, I'm sure he won't mind me talking about his very personal things, but he's in his 80s and he's got diabetes, so he's at the point where they have to do an awful lot to save his lower extremities, uh, as is very commonality in, in type 2 diabetes. That's never going to happen to you if you're an 80-year-old in America, is it? They're never going to keep you in a ward for a month. They're going to say, okay, you're going to lose your legs. We'll patch you up and send you out. 
This is a quote. Most contemporary studies po posit that a single payer universal health care system would benefit the United States. According to a 2020 study published in The Lancet, the proposed Medicare for All Act would save 68,000 lives and $450 billion in national health care expenditure every single year. Can you imagine voting against 68,000 people losing their lives? A 2022 study published in the PNAS found that a single payer universal healthcare system would have saved 212,000 lives and averted over $100 billion in medical costs during the COVID pandemic in 2020 alone. And look at education. The countries in the world with the best education systems are the freest. Denmark and Finland and Japan, Canada, Sweden, Germany, all the usual suspects. Germany has somehow managed to give free education to university level for foreigners. They may well end up winding the foreign part back, but I think we can all agree that having it for your own, uh, your own citizens is pretty bloody good to have a university education there for people that want to do it for free. Germany is one of the few countries in Europe where you can study for free even if you are not from Germany. Germans generally believe that education should not be treated as a commercial product and that free access to higher education ensures economic growth and welfare for the greater population. These things are all good for society and they all promote economic growth. There are reasons why right-wingers and ne economic neoliberalists don't want them. And that's because it makes the playing surface a bit more level. They want an unjust society. They want to have more wealth than other people in society. Where does the funding come from? In Germany, education is currently publicly funded and higher education institutions are given a budget each year by the Ministry of Education. Now, in Finland, they've all but barred private education. And there was a brilliant piece that Michael Moore did several, probably 10 years ago now, which was about public health care, public education, and so on. And it was the fact that Finland has either the first, second, or third best education system in the world because they virtually banned private education. In fact, they have realistically banned private education. And the quote that's always stuck with me is, if rich people have to go to public hospitals or public schools, they make damn sure they work. They don't care if they're not going there. They don't care if they're not sending their kids to that school in the public system. They don't care if they're not sending their child to the public hospital. If they are, they're going to be lobbying on the barricades with you. In Finland, it's true, schools have not been allowed to charge fees for almost 50 years. The Finnish Ministry of Education and Culture said charging tuition in basic education is prohibited by the Finnish constitution. Until the early 70s, Finland's uh, most secondary schools were run by private companies they were gradually brought under public control over the course of a decade as part of a wide-reaching educational changes. Uh, uh, schools not operated by the government are permitted, but they, um, but they are publicly funded and free to pupils. They charge a registration fee, but they're still publicly funded. And they only make up 2% of schools. The whole point of the private education system is to segregate the children of the wealthy. It has nothing to do with anyone being smart. We all know that the kids aren't smarter because their parents were wealthier. It's to segregate them. It's to make sure that they go to the right primary school, do the right exams there, go into the right secondary school system, do the right exams there, go into the right university system, and then take up their rightful position in a very well-paid job. It's to segregate society, is the antithesis of a meritocracy. They make all the right contacts in these schools. It actively works against the poor by keeping education out of reach and then 
having a more balanced society when it comes to all of the jobs that lead to people becoming politicians. Why is the bulk of Australian university education given to foreigners? Because it used to be free, and now we encourage them to be revenue-based, revenue-seekers. So they seek out foreign students. Every single foreign student in this country is taking the place of an Australian student that can't afford to go to university. Government funding for independent schools increased by $3,338 over the last decade for private students compared with $703 for public students. $3,300 of government funding increase went to private students. Now, these people talk about a free market economy, yet they get much more over the last 10 years than people in public schools. These private schools and private hospitals aren't involved in the free market economy because of the large essay received from right-leaning governments. The Australian government provides reoccurring fun uh, recurrent funding for every student enrolled at school. In 2023, recurrent funding for schools is estimated to be $27.3 billion, $10.6 billion to government schools, $9.3 billion to Catholic schools, and $7.4 billion to independent schools. Catholic and independent schools had the largest funding increases since 2009 and the largest declines in international test results. The figures suggest that private schools are much less efficient than public schools, especially given that public schools enroll the vast majority of disadvantaged students. By many metrics, more money goes to private education than to public education. Yet on top of that money that goes to private education, they charge fees. They can charge 20 grand a year on top of that. The whole system's screwed. And private, he private health care. John Howard introduced this whole notion that you get a rebate for your private health care, a straight gift from the taxpayer to the private health care industry, otherwise no one would be buying private health care. You get your tax return at the end, you, well, I might as well have better health care because I'm going to get my money back. What kind of capitalism is that? where you actually give the money back to the private company out of the taxpayer's purse. I think that's socialism, isn't it? We should get rid of the Medicare rebates and levies from our tax system entirely. If private enterprise is so great, why can't it stand on its own two feet without the public sector bailing it out? Not to mention the impact on the underfunded public education and healthcare systems by taking half the money and giving it to the private sector. It creates a structural inequality in society. But overall, it's a moral argument. If you think anyone's child deserves a worse education and a worse healthcare outcome because you're wealthy, what kind of person are you?